Series brought to you by Micron Technology. I'm your host, Jim Green. In each episode, we'll discuss emerging technologies in the memory and storage space. We'll also focus on the customer needs that shape evolving modern client devices as well as next generation data centers. Welcome to today's episode of Chips Out Loud podcast. Today, I'm very pleased to be joined by T. Tran, the Vice President of DRAM Process Integration here at Micron. Our topic today is going to be about DRAM, the next generation one beta process node, and the news that Micron's now shipping QS sampling of our LP DDR5X technology developed on this new process node to our smartphone customers and extending our technology leadership that domain. T, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Jim. Thanks for the opportunity. It's great. It's a a super exciting development for the one beta generation of DRAM and and shipping to mobile customers is really a big milestone. Before we jump into the details of what's going on there, let's make sure our listeners get a little bit of background, help get them up to speed. What is one beta technology and why should DRAM customers be excited about it? One beta technology is our next generation of DRAM process flow and technology that is after one alpha, which enables further shrink of our memory array cell size, as well as the rest of the circuitry in the die. Besides over 35% memory bit density gains, our customers can expect approximately 15% in power savings and continuous node-to-node performance improvements. Additionally, our customers can be super excited about our next generation high-K metal gate CMOS technology and back-end-of-line innovations, which enables one beta technology to offer the broadest product portfolio ever. It's almost like a one-stop shopping center. Recall that Micron was already leading the technology and the industry with one alpha. With our one beta, we expect to further strengthen Micron's leadership position. So this is something that our one beta DRAM team, the entire team can be really proud of. Excellent. You mentioned some of the power and and space fishy. What does it mean for customers? So if if the end customers are are buying and integrating this into technology into their devices or systems, what are some of the innovations that, that it enables and what are some of the new uses and other benefits you expect them to gain? Well, with respect to the bit growth or, you know, when we say shrinking the cell size or the die size, they can pack more bits for a given die size. So that increases their memory density or capability and also reduces the form factor, which basically a smaller die, you can, you know, make the chip smaller. You can fit more chips into a package, for example, and that also helps to reduce the power consumption. In terms of the innovations, you know, one beta, we deployed leading edge innovations in all aspects, including process, tool, new materials. That allows us to scale the size of the memory cell is one of our biggest challenges, as well as we offer high performance CMOS. So that's got next generation CMOS technology, as well as enhancements into our interconnect process technology. And all of these together allow for more aggressive shrink in all areas of the circuitry, the memory cell, the pitch cell devices, which include SenseAmp and local word line drivers, for example, as well as the peripheral circuitry. And our design innovations also enable further opportunities to, for example, run at low voltages, which also helps to reduce power consumption. And form factors, as I discussed, design innovations also can push to scale our die size and improve on both power performance. And, you know, a lot of the design tricks or inventions that we have really squeezes every bit of speed out so that the customer can see the benefit. Mm -hmm. So it's all about allowing the world to make smaller, smarter, more power efficient infrastructure. Let's face it, when you see a smart device, that device... Yes, it has a brain, but it has memory and probably has storage. So being able to shrink that and minimize the impact of that infrastructure is really vital to making that either possible or cost effective, I would imagine. Yeah, basically, you're transferring a lot more data in less time and using a lot less power. Great. So 
you know, I've got some lovely pictures of the waivers and the modules look super great, but most customers are, are probably like me. They only get to see the finished product and not really the journey that it takes to get to that product. What are some of the challenges that Micron had to conquer in the development of one beta technology to really drive that efficiency in, in size reduction and power reduction? Yeah, the challenges are endless <laughs> as we continue to, you know, push the scaling wall. We really have to squeeze every bit of everything. And that begins with uh, fundamental patterning capability. So Micron has always led the competition in our innovative pitch multiplication techniques where we've gone the longest, you know, without needing or requiring uh, UV technology, for example. And besides patterning, it's all about the race about how to make the features as small as you can and still deliver the structural integrity to meet the electrical requirements. And that is in the memory cell array, as well as the connection, you know, outside of the array, you know, the rest of the die into the array. So in terms of the challenges, as I noted earlier, since we are the industry leaders, You know, at most times, we're the ones to pave the path. And so that requires us to collaborate with vendors, suppliers, and also our customers to holistically really develop the technology to meet the requirements and, you know, minimize costs. And so besides the structural integrity, the electrical, we have to worry about performance and power from the design aspect and then system level as well. And we have to deliver a robust enough technology and broad enough where the platform can offer a variety of product portfolios that have very different requirements. So all of that, it really takes a global team to really work, you know, hand in hand together and not in silos. You mentioned it. So it's a huge lift with many, many challenges, but there's also many hands at the wheel, a lot of team members involved. But also, as you mentioned, you got a lot of ecosystem partners. Though, How do we work with them to be able to stay at the front and push that envelope without giving up, you know, trade secrets or otherwise, you know, running into risk situations? Sure. So internally within Micron, we have a global team. We have specific sites for technology development, for example, but you know our global teams are across the globe. So we basically have forums where we collaborate on a regular basis with not only the technology products group, but also our business units. Outside of Micron, we really have to partner with customers who are really key partners in developing and also helping us to deploy the alpha product so that we can learn at the early stage of the technology deployment and then ramp into it. Our product engineering has also increased focus on working very closely with our customers to really understand their needs. And also we align our timelines so that we can make sure that we have the technology ready to deliver to the key products and the key partners to leverage that momentum and not lose ground. And then if there are additional requirements, we can deploy that later in the platform and still meet the customer needs, which is very broad, as you know, in the different product platforms. So yeah, we're announcing the LPDDR5X now, but ultimately this process technology goes pretty pervasively through the portfolio, I would imagine. Oh, yes, absolutely. We offer, like I said, a variety of products. And then given more time, I can give some more specific later (laughs) on. Actually, I've got time for one last question here. So there's been a lot of innovation to meet the challenges of physics. You you know, you're getting smaller. At some point, you're dealing with atoms, right? And since you touched on it, are we nearing the end of the line for non-EU-based lithography approaches? Or do you think there's still more innovation to be had relative to, you know, where the rest of the industry has moved? Well, I'm the eternal optimist (laughs) where there's a will, there's a way, and there's still very much a will. How far can we go? Definitely, you're right. Like, you know, we're talking about angstroms of variation where we have to to care about. And, you know, when we develop, we have to develop for manufacturability. And so every atom or every angstrom counts, as we call it. But every time we think it's the end of the road, our innovative prowess, you know, sheds new light. So I still am optimistic about DRAM scaling and we will find a way somehow as we always will. But it is definitely a challenge for sure. And every node, as you know now, it's becoming extremely challenging and more costly to deploy. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. It sounds like the refrain of people who predict the end of Moore's law, right? <laughs> Innovation always raises and says, not quite yet. So I'm glad we've got problem solvers and leaders like UT. That's a great message there. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. And thanks to our listeners. Please check out the new technologies at micron.com slash technology leadership. And you can certainly learn more about Micron at www.micron.com and engage with Micron Technology on LinkedIn or in the Twitter sphere. Thanks for joining. Thank you to our audience for joining. Please listen in again on the next episode of Chips Out Loud.